Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show on this October the 17th, 2023, a Tuesday. Thank you for tuning in. Glad to have you guys here. Uh, you know, I mean, in my last couple shows, I said that the Middle East is right now is a powder keg. And I didn't really go into detail exactly why it's a powder keg. And, you know, I mean, some of you guys don't out there, because it's an old term that's come from the 1800s, powder keg. They used to carry uh, what was called black powder or gunpowder in these kegs, which would be a, a cask made out of probably oak, like a little barrel. And what would happen is, is raw gunpowder like that, it's not the gunpowder they use in, in uh, today. They have what's called safe powder today. It's totally different stuff. The stuff they had back in the 1800s was black powder. And what leaches off of black powder is a liquid that comes off of it when you store it. And that liquid is called nitroglycerin. And so if you move the kegs around, drop them. If one fell over, anything could set them off. And... Of course, you had all the kegs stored together. Boom. <laughs> they were very, very dangerous to handle. Black kegs, kegs of powder in, in those days. And uh, so that's where the saying come from, a powder keg. Anyway, let's move in. Let's find out. Let's see what's going on. Uh, now, this is a Canadian prepper channel. And uh, sometimes I go and listen to the things he has to say. And he says, red alert, we're going to war. Canada advises citizens to leave Lebanon. Well, the thing about it is, is things are heating up over there intensely. Take a look at this. Uh, let's First, let's take a look at the geography. Okay? We're going to focus right in here on, uh, on Israel. And uh, this is where the where the uh, the real thing the real is centered on right now. This is an area right in, in the southern part of Israel called Gaza, right here. And you see it's just to the southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, it's on the uh, it's it's here on the. Uh, on the uh, Mediterranean area, it's, it, the ocean borders up against it. Let's take a look, get right into the Gaza Strip here. Uh, so they can bring ships in. America can, has brought in two uh, aircraft carriers now, and they've got them stationed right in here someplace. I'm not exactly sure where. Probably out of reach of rockets, I would think. This is Gaza right here. This is the area that's being fought over right now. Uh, and this is northern Gaza. This is the area right in here where they've moved... The people that live in Gaza have moved to the southern part of Gaza because this is the area of intense interest right here in this northern area of Gaza. So about a million people, Palestinians, have been... Moving down here, I imagine they're going down this center road right here. This 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 highway right here in the center. This uh, what's it called? The uh, Salah Adin Highway that travels right down the center of Gaza. That's probably where they've been flooding down to get out of northern Gaza right here and move into the southern part in here around uh, Can, Can Yunus, Rafa. This is where they're moving down to, toward the border of the heads off into Egypt. Now, Egypt's right here. This is Egypt down here. There's Cairo. Okay. And uh, then to the north... We have uh, Lebanon. Here's here's Lebanon. Up here to the north, and Damascus, and uh, there's we got Huz Hezbollah to the north, and we've got Egypt to the south, and to the west, 
we've got places like Jordan over here to the I mean to the east is Jordan not to the west there's Jordan so that's where it's located now now we got Syria up to the north here and we've got uh, over here the countries I wanted to talk about is Iraq is just to the east over here is, is, is Iraq and Baghdad and then when you move just a little bit further you're into Iran so Iran borders up against Iraq there's Iran right there and then you move a little bit further you you get Pakistan over here right bordering up against Iran so you got Iran and then Pakistan right there so where's the nukes in all this area who's the big players in nukes Who's who's a king and the queen and everything else? If it's a chess game, you know, uh, Pakistan is a nuclear power. Wanted to point that out. Uh, Iran is on the borderline of being a nuclear power. Possibly they've got what they need to build nuclear weapons and. Saudi Arabia says, uh, well, if, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, we probably will want them. Probably will want them, too. Israel has their Samson option. Israel. Uh, whatever that means, you can figure it out for yourself. <laughs> uh, but very, very powerful. Samson option. Uh, now the United States is obviously a nuclear power, and they are uh, they are stationed right in here, and, and an awful lot of their planes and stuff can carry nuclear weapons. Uh, and of course, they have probably might have submarines hid. Goodness knows they might if they're bringing in. But of course, they're not going to say anything about where the submarines are located. America's got submarines all in the water everywhere. And so this is a hotbed because you've got Israel sort of surrounded, completely surrounded here with hostility. And a lot of the nations in there want Israel gone. You know, and uh, let's see what Pakistan is saying. Because Pakistan is a nuclear power. Pakistan and weapons of mass destruction. Pakistan is one of the nine states to present, that possess nuclear weapons. Pakistan began developing nuclear weapons in January of 1972. Uh, they are committed to having the device ready by the end of 1976. Yeah, I was just a little kid. And they already had nuclear weapons. Talking 1974 and stuff. So Pakistan is is solidly in the nuclear camp. Well, what, what does Pakistan think about all this, this war going on? Uh, let me see. I had the article right here. Uh, Pakistan adopts a careful tone on Israel. Experts are reading between the lines. It says Pakistan has responded to the Israel Hamas war with unusually measured tone, standing out among Asia's Muslim minority majority countries and fueling speculation about the chances of Islamabad someday normalizing ties with Israel. The Pakistan government is typically a harsh critic of Israel, uh, with which it's had no diplomatic relations and a defender of Palestinian rights. But while countries such as Indonesia and Malaysia have pointedly blamed the conflict on Israeli policy, Pakistan has so far taken, taken a softer, softer uh, approach. So, what we see about Pakistan is they're a very strong nuclear power, but they're kind of staying in the in the shadows for now let's just put it that way you know but 
they could erupt into this war at some point. Uh, what could erupt them into this war is they border on uh, Iran. Okay? So Iran gets into the conflict. That could very well happen. And very, very soon. If nukes start to fly, which they could, Well, what about if, 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 if radioactive fallout starts to fall from Iran onto Pakistan across the border? What then? What would happen then? Just, just saying. I mean, we're just looking at what ifs, you know? Now, Iran, what could cause that to happen? Well, Iran right now, Iran, let's take a look here. Iran has enough enriched uranium to build several nuclear weapons, the United Nations says. So, they've been quiet over there for a little while. They're doing something. <laughs> they got something going on. I guarantee you. I, I, just, I just can smell it that something's going on over there. And if they got what they need to build it, I mean, the hardest part to, to get it, from what I understand is to get the enriched uranium. That's the hardest part. What would stop them? Now, at this point, if they got enough enriched uranium to build a number of nuclear weapons, what's going to stop them from building them once they got the enriched uranium? So they're giving warnings here. Uh... They have 70 kilograms, 155 pounds of uranium enriched at 60%. It says the danger remains that they're going to build a nuclear weapon. Who knows? We don't know what they've got. They're not going to come out and say, hey, you know what? We've got five nuclear weapons. They're not going to do that. You're not going to hear nothing. So if, uh, let's just say, what well, if this thing were to go nuclear? And it could, because what you're dealing with is nations in the Middle East. There's a lot of nuclear weapon, and there's a lot of nuclear weapons that that are unaccounted for in the world too, as well. Oh, all it would take is what about all those missing Russian suitcase bombs and stuff? You know, all it would take is some little, it wouldn't have to be big, an incident in the Middle East at this point. And we know what a hotbed in the Middle East is and just how volatile it is, right? and especially right now. Now, the President of the United States is heading over to the Middle East right now, and he's going to visit Israel. I doubt anything's going to happen much in the next few days. I think he, Wednesday is the day I think he's going. Tomorrow. While he's in Israel. I don't think not anything much is going to happen. I think that this whole thing, this whole conflaboration that's going on over in... Over in uh, or, I mean, it just could work out exactly the opposite from what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> there is that to consider. But I don't think, this is my opinion on it, is I don't think much is going to happen in the next couple of days until he gets back from wherever and whatever he's doing. And I think this could be the little bit of a calm before the storm right now. Because Iran has said about what would happen if they do a ground invasion in Gaza. Iran said... That that's like a big red line for them. And, you know, I mean, they're not taking all those big ships over there, the United States, to help Israel unless something big's going on behind the scenes. But perhaps we don't even know about at this point. So give it a couple more days, a few more days, I would say. And then we're going to see maybe some fireworks start to happen in the Middle East. And I mean, it could get out of hand really fast. And one of the reasons why I tell you guys this is because there's so much hate built up. 
centered and focused on that region of the world. That if you're living over here in, in, in these countries over here, you can just feel it. It's pungent. It's in the air. You can just feel it. The hate over there. Tremendous amounts of hate. One side hating the other side. Just pure, unadulterated, uh, uh, like if you were to, how they distill alcohol. This is like 100, 200 proof. Pure alcohol is so flammable that it'll actually burn. Hate that's been distilled to that point. That's over there in the Middle East. Hate that's built up for thousands of years of history. Of just pure hatred and animosity. And this is what's fueling this. And now, the United States has moved into that area of hate. On one side... On the other side, we have the BRICS forces who are standing right right in the background, just in the shadows behind Iran. So they've moved into the area of, of, of intense hatred, moved onto the fringe line. They're just like standing right there in the shadows. America's standing in the shadows on the other side, behind Israel. If you if if you don't think this is a hotbed for something that just could absolutely explode into a war that could carry the world into a third world war, then you're not keeping your eyes open. And and I'm not talking a long time from now. I'm talking all this shit's gonna hit the fan. Excuse my French. Could with very well within the next week or two. Could just explode into what it is. And what is it? Exactly what I told you. It is the world center where all the hate in the entire world is focused on one area in the Middle East. In that region. That entire region. And I'm not focusing on one side or the other and putting any blame. I'm not laying any blame on anybody because this has a history that goes back all the way back to human origins to an area that was referred to in ancient times as the Fertile Crescent. It's where the origins of humanity started. This is the root of humanity in around the Persian Gulf region. An oil-rich region it wasn't always a desert. I mean, I could get into this subject and start going down this road of the water erosion around the Sphinx and stuff that indicates that this area at one time was called the Fertile Crescent for a good reason. Of course, planets change, you know, and, and the geography changes. And deserts can form in areas that used to be fertile. Anyway, moving on. Uh, getting back to what we're talking about here. Uh, and we're going to take a look at the silver price today. Uh, 2289. Now, if this manipulation that they've been doing. Uh, I'm changing the subject. I'm getting on to silver now. If this manipulation that they've been doing continues to follow its course that they've laid. They let it get up around this price, maybe $23.50, $24 at tops, and then they'll smack it down again. Back down the mining production costs again. So that they're right on the leaving the miners a small profit sort of thing. Uh, they've been playing this game, and they're going to continue to play this game until they can't any longer. There's a turning point coming up when everybody's going to realize that the jig's up for the Federal Reserve in their efforts to maintain strength in the dollar. And the key to all this is oil. And the key to all uh, the key to oil is is the Middle East. <laughs> so you turn one key. 
the Middle East turns one key to key to oil, and then the key to oil turns the key to the financial system here, and because it changes the aspect of hyperinflationary ratios of, 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 of what will happen with the dollar, the value of the dollar. The value of the dollar has always been tied to oil all the way back to 1971, when it was tied to gold before 1971, and then it became tied to oil. So the fate of oil is the fate of the dollar. And they don't call it the petrodollar for nothing. Petro being oil, basically. Uh, you know, an awful lot of people out there do not make the connection between the gasoline that you buy at the pumps and oil. They don't realize that the oil price affects the gasoline price because gasoline is a derivative of oil. They don't, real, they don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. Something that simple. But, you know, an awful lot of people, they're just... They know everything about TikTok, but they don't know anything about even where gasoline comes from. And I'm going to just tell you guys honestly, uh, probably between two and 3,000 people will watch my show today at least. And probably out of that two or 3,000 people, there's probably going to be about 20 or 30 people out in my audience who are going to say, I didn't know that. I didn't know that gasoline was actually oil. <laughs> I know. But it's not because people are dumb. It's, no, that's not it. They're not dumb. It's just something that they didn't know. Something may be obvious to most everybody else, but... They just didn't make the connection all their life. They didn't make the connection. And all of a sudden they say, Hey, Glenn said that oil is turned into gasoline. That's where gasoline comes from. They're just going to all of a sudden, and, and then they'll know it for the rest of their life because you can't unknow it unless you get Alzheimer's or something. Anyway, by gosh, I'm drifting off subject matter. But sometimes you just got to. <laughs> we get on a little bit of a roll and get on the subject. Uh, anyway, guys, so we were looking at twenty-two ninety-one for silver today, and they're probably, if they can keep the game going that they've been keeping going for the longest time, they'll probably knock it back to twenty-one fifty again if they can. <laughs> you know, it'll bounce back to twenty. So they're going to keep this going as long as they can. How, how long is that until this shift occurs? Until everybody out there says, hey, uh-oh, uh-oh, it's going to be hyperinflation. And they finally come to that realization that it's going to be inflation. But a lot of them out there right now are still in this thing. Well, the Fed's going to keep raising rates and we're going to have this. And yes, we could. But if it does happen, it's going to be very, very short-lived. It could actually be only a matter of hours because you saw how quick the Fed reacted to the Silicon Valley banking crisis. With a, within a week, they had 400 billion. 400 billion, almost a half a trillion dollars in there. Laid it right on the barrel head. So it's not a problem for them and they can react really fast. So if things start to turn downwards, but here's the thing, war, war can actually stimulate a stock market. It's a great cover-up. They do all their, their malfeasance in the system, all their crooked corruption and everything else, and war is a good cover-up for them. War rallying the troops, nothing like it. They get their political, in the polls they start to look bad, and then everybody is disgusted with them because it's a, it's a, the economy's not doing good because they've pilfered all your money. And they cover it all up by going to war. I mean, just look at the timing. Look how our economy is about ready to, to go to the crapper here in North America. And look, look at the war coming. And these, they told you, people like Gerald Salenti, they, Gerald Salenti, they told you clearly for years now, shouting it on the rooftops, Gerald Salenti was saying, when all else fails, they take you to war. And you know, it was it was me. I didn't totally believe him that it was true. 
I was like, mm, yeah, I was listening to him and everything, saying that for years, saying that. Now I can see it's absolutely true. He's right on the money. I should have listened to him more, what he had to say about that. But, oh my goodness, this is dangerous in the modern day, because now we're not talking about war like in the past, when all they had was just the old standard bombs they used to drop out of the airplanes or whatever, with just gunpowder in them, basically. They're like big fireworks. Now they got the fission, nuclear fission. What a dangerous world we live in. And it's so vulnerable. We've made a world for ourselves. Look, look, look. Going back to the 1800s and stuff with the horse and buggies and everything else, they had a world that was practically indestructible. None of them had electricity, so they wouldn't miss it. <laughs> they didn't have grocery stores to go to for the food. They produced it on the farm individually. Uh, they all had dug wells, and they could they got fresh water for themselves right there. They were all survivalists, but better than our today's survivalists who have a bunch of canned beans and stuff. These these people back then they had they had they knew how to produce the food from the ground. The best sort of survivalists, practically indestructible, they were to calamity. And they had they had a, a big uh, uh, the Carrington event, you know. They had an electrical discharge from a solar flare that today would have knocked all the power out and put us in the Stone Age. And they didn't even notice it except for the telegraph operators. They noticed it because they were the only ones with electronic equipment. We had an indestructible society practically to any sort of disaster. A society that could take almost anything. Now we're so vulnerable. Now we got a society that the whole thing relies upon everything else. It's all interconnected and it's all it all relies on the internet, really. The internet goes down. You tell me when war comes how they're going to keep the internet up. They got all these undersea cables running between the countries that carry the internet. That are so vulnerable. You remember how how in this war? Do you remember how they've they've cut these gas lines, undersea gas lines? You just wake up in the morning, not oh, the undersea gas lines cut, and the bubbles are bubbling out of the ocean. Who did it? Oh gosh, only knows. Well, it'll be the same way as they cut the undersea cables that carry the internet. Except the big difference is. Is you weren't affected so much. When they, well, some people were affected. Some, you know, had a cold winter in Europe. But not to the extent if the Internet goes down worldwide, we don't have any Internet service. How are you going to pay with your debit card at that point? How are you going to find out what's going on? How are they going to let... See, back in the days like the 1800s, they had ways to get news around. They had something called newspaper, a printed paper. People used to wait for the news to find out what was going on. Now all we got is these stupid cell phones that are all connected to the Internet again. You know, the power grid goes down. I can tell you guys right now that they're not ready for an extended power outage. Your cell phone service goes out about two or three days, if that, after the power grid's gone down. Because all these cell phone towers, if they do have battery backup... The battery's only made to last a, a, a couple days, and then it goes dead. Water supplies will go dead. Everything will go dead if the internet goes down. Because people won't have any way of actually... We all rely upon this, this total network of, tele, of communications networks. The internet goes down, all that's cut, and we got nothing, no, no redundant system in place. Oh my gosh. We're just like we're going to be stranded. We will be in no better condition if that happens because we've made ourselves so vulnerable. We'll be in no better position than somebody who, who goes on a ship. And they take them out to a desert island someplace and they set them off on shore and say, here, take care of yourself. 
In fact, we might not be in as good a shape because at least the people on the desert island got coconuts they can eat and stuff. You know? We might be worse off. And so everything could get started. Uh, and suddenly, uh, unexpectedly, this whole thing could just erupt. And, and, and only in a few days from now, when the Middle East erupts. The whole world's just like a stinking time bomb. Tick, 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 tick. So anyway, here's the silver and gold today. I got on a little bit of a tear, but you know, you guys got to keep prepping. That's all I can tell you. And at least when you're prepping, you feel like you're doing something. Well, you are doing something. You're doing something to help yourself, and it might come in invaluable in the end. But it also gives you in a sense like, hey, I have a little bit of control here over this situation on my own personal level. Where the real truth is you've got a bunch of maniacs at the wheel of the bus, and we're all on the bus, and they're taking us toward the cliff. <laughs> okay, so gold today. Yeah, okay. I'll settle. I'll settle down. I'll get off of this tear a little bit. But uh, gold is up four dollars and twenty cents at nineteen twenty-three. Now crypto today, we're seeing Bitcoin. She's starting to a little bit of a roll right now at twenty-eight thousand five hundred and thirty-seven. And Ethereum's at 1579. Now Bitcoin Bitcoin's a long way off of its sixty-eight thousand dollar high. So it's still less than half the price it used to be. XRP is forty-nine point forty-nine point one cents for XRP today. Dow Jones Industrial Average is up ninety-five points at thirty-four thousand seventy-nine. Now, taking a look at crude oil, it's down 84 cents at 85.82. By gosh, this really might take an awful jump. Depending on what's going to happen in the Middle East in the next few days or months or weeks. Bonds and rates today, we're looking at rising yields again. U.S. 10-year crested 4.8%. So it's it's almost 4.9%. It's 4.8. Oh, no, it's almost 4.81, but it's 4.8. It's up 9 basis points today. And the U.S. 30 years at 4.9, and it's up 4.9 basis points today. So bonds are continuing to rise. Taking a look at the dollar index, and the dollar index looks like it's going down today. It's at 106.05. We're keeping our eye here on this channel on the situation in the Middle East as it develops. Uh, is this Israel? What does this say right here? Click on it and see. Israel Hamas war sends shekel to eight year low on fears of economic blowback. Israel's shekel touched its weakest level against the United States dollar in more than eight years on Monday. It looks like it's getting worse. Look at it shooting up. The shekel. Okay, thank you guys for listening. Like and subscribe. Mention my channel to a friend. <laughs> and we'll catch you guys in the next show and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.